Great, wonderful. Thank you, John, for the nice introduction, and Greg for inviting me to, to give this talk today. So I've been asked to uh, kind of go over and introduce uh, PET radiopharmacy, uh, radiochemistry, basically the, the mindset behind uh, um, making the radio traces that would uh, feed into the positron emission tomography system. As uh, requested, uh, I have no uh, conflicts of uh, financial interests uh, with respect to this uh, talk today. So uh, as uh, stated in the abstract, the uh, highlights will be uh, to talk about uh, PET, uh, looking at various different uh, uh, strategies, chemical structures uh, to be radio labeled with a variety of different radioisotopes. Uh, looking from uh, carbon 11 and fluorine 18 as the uh, the two uh, major players in in uh, radioisotope labeling, and then more recently with a generator produced uh, gallium 68. Um, categorized uh, radio tracers and radio ligands can be applied to study different areas, uh, including cardiology, neuropsychiatry, and oncology. So the basic uh, in this, uh, uh, I guess, food chain of molecular food chain, or, or the, the 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 process of selecting uh, a, a target and then finding the imaging modality that you're interested in, chemistry uh, is is very a critical part of this uh, of this plan. And so, ultimately, through preclinical evaluation and for promising tracers, translation into the clinic uh, that will hopefully benefit uh, the patients in in, in, the, in the hospital. So uh, with respect to the dimensional modalities, here you can see PET. Uh, <clears throat> it is uh, uh, um, quite useful in its own right. It's very sensitive uh, compared to uh, some of the uh, other modalities you see with respect to functional imaging and, and with respect to uh, molecular imaging. And so uh, looking at compounds as it plays within uh, the radiobiology, uh, uh, of looking at different diseases. And so um, what I'd like to do is basically for those uh, making the presumption that uh, you're fairly new to PET, and so I'd like to make an analogy here, looking at comparing the human body with the planet Earth, and instead of having the PET detection system, we have a satellite on the outset in the atmosphere, one to look in, and then finding some, some details about the Earth. And let's say we just start zooming in on the Earth and maybe towards southwest uh, United States and looking at the uh, Southern California area and you can see all the highways and, and whatnot maybe representing vasculature in the body and in a more more in-depth um, looking at potential um, buildings for example where we're looking at uh, wanting to send in molecular detectives or detectives to go and interrogate people in the buildings and maybe send some information up to the satellites. So these detectives that we use for PET are, are what we call molecular detectives that help patrol the city, which is, in this case, uh, um, a, su a subset of the, of the human body. And these molecular detectives that work, uh, in this case, in a preclinical imaging uh, project where we're looking at uh, mice here that's been xenographed with some tumor cells in the shoulder. And you can see uh, that these molecular detectives can show where the tumor is uh, with respect to the, the rest of the living subject. Promising traces, and I guess uh, that, that uh, promising traces that is, uh, are are moved towards to first demand studies uh, for for novel imaging agents, and we have to do the the potential regulatory uh, uh, steps and, and looking at evaluating it in a in a normal normal subject. In this case, a cancer free patient looking at a, a novel tracer, for example, that that shows us the biodistribution of the tracer within the human body. So, what are examples of a PET detective? So. The PET detective or PET imaging agent in this case uh, is illustrated here in this, this cartoon where we have a target we're interested in, in, in pursuing and in imaging, and we have an idea of the actual key to this lock or the, the carrier that would bind and find in this uh, particular uh, molecular target. With respect to the carrier, we also need to be able to see this uh, carrier, so we had to put a particular label. So for molecular imaging agents, you can have a variety of different labels. You can be radioactive for PET and SPECT, but you can also have non-radioactive labels that fluoresce, and, and also, as you, you will know, with, with MR, you can potentially have gadolinium and, and whatnot. So uh, with respect to this imaging agent, we can also play around with the linker, which allows us to, to, to uh, modify uh, the structure in a sense to in favor, for example, hydrophilic in favor of flexibility, overall charge, if we're looking at uh, penetrating the blood-brain barrier. Uh, these are important uh, aspects of the mo molecule and compound so that they make sure that uh, the compound can target uh, um, the, the biomarker that we're, we're interested in. Um, and and these, these different um, tracers that is, uh, oops, 
uh, can actually ask questions and, and tease out uh, um, some information about receptor avid uh, avidity, metabolic information, pharmacokinetics, and pharmacodynamics uh, with respect to the molecule we're looking at. So here's a couple of cartoons here where we're talking about potential pet imaging targets categorized in three general uh, kind of categories here. Um, blood flow, um, for example, O15 water uh, and N13 ammonia. O15 water uh, can measure blood flow within the brain, so it's a lot of times it's used to, to look at stroke. Uh, uh, and also for uh, ammonia, N13 ammonia, we'll look at cardiac uh, cases uh, looking at blood flow. Uh, the next example is looking at binding. We can, we can actually label a molecule that actually locks into a receptor, and if it's irreversible or reversible, if it's reversible, it can come off and have an equilibrium with binding with receptor, and for example, caramel 11 racopride is known to, to, to bind to dopamine D2 receptors. And the last uh, example, uh, where you can look at metabolism and enzymes, looking at, <coughs> excuse me, hexokinase and looking at glucose metabolism for FD, FDG, or for example, uh, other enzyme uh, uh, biology such as caspase 3 involved with apoptosis, and there's a, a tracer that we have called 18FC SNAT that we're trying to translate in the declinic. So, so how does positive emission tomography, so from the chemistry standpoint, we, we're looking at the radioisotope. In this case, you're looking at the example here as F18. The F18 radioisotope is a positron emitter, so it's a positron uh, is emitted and then uh, interacts with an electron that, ha that, that produces an annihilation event uh, that gives off two uh, opposing photons of 11 keV, or 5511 5, keV. Uh, that is basically detected by uh, the ring detectors uh, that are built within the PET scanner. In this case, this uh, subject is a rat <coughs> where we give the tracer via IV injection. In this case, for, for rodents, IV injection is usually typically given through the tail. And then so the, the radio tracer is, is distributed through the body, and it's looking for its target. In this case, it could be a particular cancer that it's looking for. And what you see here, represented by the, this um, uh, uptake here in this area, is looking at the bladder at where the tracer is, is cleared um, <coughs> uh, through the body uh, once it gets metabolized. And so within the tumor, you have the annihilation event where you have the opposing photons, and that's where you, you get all the information that's compiled to generate your uh, three-dimensional information. So with respect to the isotopes, how do we make it? We use a, what we call a medical cyclotron. The medical cyclotron typically can range from 11 MeV to uh, quite a bit more. Uh, um, uh, generally, it's around uh, 15 or 16 uh, MeV that, uh, uh, that accelerates uh, the protons in this case. But uh, in this example, this particular cyclotron also accelerates deuterons. Uh, in this case, uh, six uh, ports uh, are available for this particular cyclotron. Uh, it, that allows us to, for example, have fluorine 18, N13, O15, carbon 11, and then uh, a gas version of uh, 18F, which is uh, in this case fluorine gas. So there's a multitude. I'm only showing a, a snapshot of, of, of the more popular ones that, that are typically used in our field to radio label different scaffolds, different structures. And again, like I said, we'll, we'll focus on more or less carbon 11 F18 for, for like a time today and maybe touch upon the generator produced gallium 68 at the very end. <clears throat> So as we move forward in this talk, I'd like to make sure that we understand some, some terminologies. So in this case, um, we're looking at a carrier. A carrier is typically the non-radioactive version of the radiopharmaceutical. Uh, in this case, uh, this is an example where you have a, a C12 in this position of the carrier versus the carbon-11 radioactive version, uh, which is called a radioligand in this case. Uh, we also have another term called pseudocarrier, which resembles quite a bit uh, in, with respect to the, the rest of the scaffold of the carrier and the radial ligand, but in this case you see it's missing, missing a methyl group. However, although it's missing a methyl group, it still retains some biological uh, activity and uh, binding affinity, so we had to consider this a, as a uh, potential problem when we're looking at designing uh, new, new radio tracers if, if the met metabolic stability uh, should become an issue. 
Another term called specific radioactivity, although radiopharmaceuticals is defined as the ratio of the activity, uh, typically in the U.S. it's in Curies, everywhere else is Becquerel's, uh, uh, to the accompanying carrier of, of mole as expressed in this case uh, for U.S. terms, uh, Curies per mole or, or some equivalent uh, 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 term, terminology uh, with respect to the units there. Carbon 11, F18 labeled rate of pharmaceuticals uh, can oftentimes be diluted with carrier. A carrier and uh, can be introduced through a lot of natural factors. For carbon 11, it could be CO2 that we breathe out. Uh, that's all, all available uh, and can count, confound the specific activity for fluorine. It could be material uh, residual fluoride that, that, that's in a lot of the chemicals and even, even within the glassware that we use. So specific activity generally decreases as well according to half-life of radioisotope. Uh, the mass does not change within the within the within a given uh, uh, solution. However, as decay happens over over uh, this half life, the radioactivity in the numerator uh, gets uh, decreases. As we describe re pet radio pharmaceuticals with respect to specific radioactivity, we have to keep in mind everything is related to a specific time. So the specific activity can be described at the in the bombardment, in the synthesis, or time of injection. So for carbon 11, short fairly short half life. 20 minutes. In this case, we're looking into the design of a radiochemistry strategy from radionuclide production, and then we'll dump the target load into the uh, module for our radio synthesis. At this point, where we dump the, uh, the, the bombard the material from the production from the cyclotron, that's called in the bombardment. <coughs> we'll prepare the labeling agent, do the reaction, potentially uh, do also a deprotection step that reveals our our, our final labeled product, and then we'll, we'll actually do a formulation and purification uh, at the end to, to make it uh, safe for human uh, injection. Uh, this takes uh, generally about three half-lives, and then there's also the required quality control to make sure it is indeed safe, that it is, does pass all set pre-criteria, generally over four half-lives. So as I described, at, at, you can have 98 millicarries of product in this different way of looking at the same uh, similar uh, process. Uh, if, you, if you started off with two carriers of activity, that comes at about four, four point, almost 5% at, uh, uh, at the end of um, when you're ready to deliver the, uh, the product. However, in the synthesis, if you did great correct time, you see that the yield actually bumps up to 8.2. And then at start of synthesis, 23, and then almost 27% if you decay correct to in the bombardment. So when you look at literature, when you're talking about um, radiochemical yields, you just have to be, uh, be careful at what time point they are talking about uh, when they calculated this number. Carbon-11 uh, is, is, is uh, you know, uh, being introduced in any organic compound. It's uh, a lot of uh, chemistry exists, so, so in this case, the versatile uh, radiochemistry uh, is available for us to make a whole list of compounds. For example, we talked about raclopride, uh, we talked uh, C11-PIB for those interested in Alzheimer's disease, imaging beta amyloid, uh, flumazenil, looking at GABA-A receptors uh, for epilepsy and fragile X, for an example. There's, again, in the disease level, in the areas of research that we can apply these tracers to, um, we can look at cardiology, neuropsychiatry, and oncology. And as, just as a snapshot, you know, starting from a PN, a P alpha reaction, that is, this is a nuclear reaction from the from the cyclotron. We can make a diverse. Uh, and here's just a sample of labeling agents that we use to to label uh, carbon-11 uh, uh, compounds. And we're looking at specific activity. Here's the equation that we use for reactive uh, decay. Uh, generally, the take-home message here is that, you know, um, in, in theory, we should be getting specific activities on the range of, of 10 to the fourth curies per micromole. But in, in real life, because of all the different things that we do encounter with, with uh, CO2 in the atmosphere and whatnot, uh, uh, it's rarely, you know, it's typically around 10 curies per micromole. And, and uh, with dilution cameras, about, ten, uh, about, about 1,000 times in dilution. So why worry about specific activity? So if the, the term radiopharmaceuticals could be further refined to, uh, to basically uh, categorize uh, a set of compounds called radiotracers. These are the tracers that trace the in vivo processes, looking at metabolism and blood flow. Generally, high specific activity is not required in this case. However, if we're looking at radio ligands, another category uh, uh, descri describing radio pharmaceuticals, they have to bind to molecular targets such as receptors, proteins, and enzymes. Generally, high specific activity is required. As you can imagine, uh, having other non-radioactive versions or carrier that we talked 
about will now compete with the radial ligand to these limited number of receptors, proteins, and enzymes, and thus uh, could actually uh, uh, give you a poor signal to noise uh, with respect to imaging this target. Fluorin 18, uh, you're looking at a half life of close to 110 minutes. Uh, and again, um, the fluorine 18 is, uh, is used because it mimics or basically in the same similar size as hydrogen and, and, and also a hydroxyl group and organic compounds. Uh, because of this, uh, the longer half-life, this is amenable for slower kinetic uh, biology. Uh, and so uh, uh, things that, that have to uh, require a fast kinetics, uh, uh, or, or that, not, sorry, not require, but um, that have fast kinetics uh, can actually uh, use carbon-11 in that case because uh, of the short half-life. Different forms of fluorine 18, I won't go through this too much detail, but just two different kinds. One for nucleophilic substitution reactions, one for uh, electrophilic substitution reactions. And since the 70s, here's the historic kind of uh, uh, chronological uh, advance of, of different uh, strategies of labeling fluorine 18 in the chemistry and to generate a variety of different compounds for us to use in, in pet imaging. Uh, and, and so for simplicity, this, this is a, the very basic where we're talking about the uh, aqueous form of fluoride that we have to man manipulate and be able to perform organic chemistries by complexing it with an organic compound and, and, and removing the water so that the, that the organic uh, solvents can actually pr uh, dissolve and, and, and interact with this uh, modified uh, fluoride uh, complex uh, to do the, the organic reactions. And typically, these are type of the apparatus that you see we'll, we'll use for, for, for kind of a uh, bench, uh, bench side uh, radio chemistry that's uh, kind of just testing out the, the waters of how the chemistry is performing. But once we ha have optimized the conditions, we'll, we'll actually uh, kind of uh, translate these to these automatic uh, modules now uh, where there's a variety of different uh, modules out in the market commercially now, but here's just an example of some of these that, that are in our lab, uh, whether it's cassette based or we have to front load them uh, and then the chemistry is all done behind lead shielding around two inches of lead on all, all sides, uh, protects the chemist from radiation dosimetry and because of this remote automated nature, it can actually load reagents in sequential order as you design it and actually heat it or cool it as needed and then process the and purify the materials and finally formulate it so that it can be tested for quality control um, uh, prior to your uh, preclinical or ultimately your clinical studies. Again, here's uh, examples of a variety of different F18 label compounds. Uh, FPPRG2 is something that we've uh, used in our, our clinic uh, looking at angiogenesis in cancer, targeting alpha v beta 3 integrins. CSNAT, I've talked about caspase 3 more recently. Now, hopefully, I'll use this as an example to the rest of this talk, uh, looking at sigma 1 receptors, looking at pain and addiction. Although FDG uh, was primarily used for, for cancer imaging, uh, it also has many other uses looking at epilepsy, Alzheimer's, glioblastoma, and, and uh, in this case, cancer metastases. So as a radio chemistry lab, we have to then uh, keep this in mind that as we make these various tracers, whether it's uh, uh, where we wear two hats, uh, whereas this is a commercial lab or our academic lab at Stanford, uh, we can provide uh, uh, clinical grade radio tracers to, to basically feed into and funnel into our clinical PET CT program as well as our clinical PET MR program. Uh, however, as, as we continue to try to strive to develop more novel imaging agents, we also have to uh, make these compounds available uh, to the, uh, the preclinical studies to hopefully uh, make improvements on, on new tracers that will help uh, increase the sophistication of the PET-CT and PET-MR imaging. Okay. And uh, I've already described this, but the last part of this is basically we also exploit and try to find new technologies as well as develop new census strategies to help uh, improve the efficiencies as well as the, the, the relative ease of providing these traces to the clinic. So in the last uh, bit of time, uh, I, I want to take through from beginning to end, from bench to bedside, one example. In this case is F18, FTC146 one, one targeting sigma-1 receptors. This has been an effort for 10 years now. Uh, sigma-1 receptors uh, has been implicated in a whole host of different uh, uh, pathologies and, and so, um, so but we're, we're going to primarily look at uh, chronic pain in, in this case. Uh, found quite prevalent in the human brain, 
a lot of folks have been working on this uh, chemistry in the last couple of decades. Uh, this is our, our tracer for comparison. If you look at binding affinity, uh, this is something that we have to look at. When we look at uh, currently made compounds versus what we try to plan to make, where can we make improvements? In this case, you have bone accumulation. In this case, where that means the, there's metabolic issues where the, where the chemistry uh, is, un, is not stable and it's uh, defluorinating. And then the, the, the fluorine goes to bone and gives you bone accumulation or bone uptake. So the uh, only one that doesn't have that is carbon 11 because uh, carbon 11 uh, doesn't have fluoride, the radioactive fluoride, to give us the, uh, the confounding bone uh, uptake issues with uh, unstable uh, compounds. When we go through this process, we have to make a what we call reference standard. The reference standard in this case is a non-radioactive F19 version of this, and this is this allows us to confirm the identity of the compound. And so you can see the process of making this. You don't need to understand the chemistry, but just look at the pieces here. is is, is quite a bit different than than the way we have to make the the fluorine 18 version of the compound. But in essence, this compound is exactly the same as this one, except the you have a fluorine 18 here as opposed to fluorine 19. So this process again moves through and, and looks at uh, beginning and I won't belabor this we have to look at cell cell uptake studies looking at you know expressing cells that have high target expression that shows uh, high uptake of our, our, our compound looking at uh, translating it through rodents mouse and up to primates. Uh, we also even looked at uh, having to test to make sure is this uh, tracer truly uh, binding to target, so we had to uh, create a knockout mouse model where we basically knock out the more target. So there's no sigma one receptors in the animal, and you can see that there's basically no uptake compared to the baseline wild type, which is what we call a normal mouse that would have that target in it. So in this case, for example, for regions of interest, hippocampus, cortex, cardiopetamin, and cerebellum all show nice uptake relative to the knockout mice, which does not. Uh, here are autoradiography studies that also do this. And why do we need to do this? Because FDA and, 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 and folks are all requiring us to validate to make sure that we just don't say, oh, by the way, the tracer is binding to the target that you think it is. You have to actually show validation. And so in this case, we were doing uh, autoradiography which is taking the uh, basically slices of the brain and actually developing pictures of it so we can look at slice. So we have a slice of the normal versus the knockout to see basically no, virtually no uptake in the knockout animal uh, in various different regions. We also stained with a non-radioactive uh, imaging, uh, looking at what we call immunohistochemistry and antibody looking at basically, again, normal and a knockout. And basically knockout, you have no uptake of the antibody uh, showing uh, any, any presence of sigma-1 receptors. <laughs> well, with respect to pain, <coughs> We understand it's published that there is an upregulation of sigma-1 receptors because of Schwann cell activation due to nerve injury. And so if sigma-1 receptors are upregulated in pathological pain, which, which is known in the literature, uh, maybe we can create uh, or, or basically use, and then this is where we have to use an animal model uh, to actually test this before we can go into humans. And in this animal model, we create uh, a pain model where, where they're very sensitive uh, and to a particular neuroma that's created. And if you look at this, uh, at the view where we're looking at a micro pet of animals here in this case, where there's the, the nerve injury occurring here compared to the opposite side that's normal, uh, you can see uptake of tracer, uh, of this particular tracer compared to blocked, uh, what we call sham, and control, right? And so ultimately you see nice uptake and we actually even extracted the nerve out to show, to show that this is, this is the case. Um, in the same uh, validation that needs to be made for this model, we also had to do uh, autoradiography and immunohistochemistry to show that you do see a po uh, increased proliferation of swan cells and also increased receptors in, in the neuroma. So what are the paths that we can take a pet tracer to clinic? Well, I'm not going to uh, basically expand on this due to time, but later on uh, in the session, uh, David Dick will actually expand on, on a variety of different uh, regulatory procedures that, that's a, a more of a global perspective of this. But in the U.S., there's generally four different uh, regulatory pathways uh, 
for re per, uh, uh, performing clinical research, uh, and typically the, the classic case has been an IND and, and also RDRC um, uh, for known compounds, and more recently within the last 10 years what we call an exploratory IND. So for this compound, we, we did an exploratory IND. Uh, this is a general for those looking at the radiopharmacy side of things, what typical things are we actually looking at? pH, radiochemical and chemical purity, specific activity, are there any organic solvents left behind from the chemistry, you know, organic residues, the filter integrity test, we have to test the filter to actually did the uh, uh, sterilizing uh, uh, of your material into a sterile vial. Bacterial endotoxins, and identification, visual inspection, radionuclide identity, if we're a lab that works with multitude of uh, different types of radioisotopes, you know, are we, do we, do we, do we have, you know, copper 64 by mistake in there somehow, instead of fluorinating, we have to identify the uh, radionuclide and ultimately sterility. And the take home message from here is, all the ones in blue have to be performed and have to pass before we can release for human administration. The one that's uh, written in red, it requires a two week uh, sterility test. That's the only one that's post, uh, post um, uh, tests. And, and for this particular one, we did carry through and look at uh, the candidates uh, uh, and, and IND, EIND um, approval in t uh, May of 2015 and December. So this is a long process of doing this. Uh, and since February, we were able to do 10 healthy controls and are beginning to look at cohorts of pain and GBM and, and hoping to expand this to some of the other pathologies that we're looking at. Here's a picture of our PET-MR scanner that was uh, installed in 2013, and these are our first images of our tracer in man, and the good news is that there isn't any bone uptake, so we're pretty happy that this compound did survive and stable in, in, in humans. So uh, I, I'm running out of time here, so in the last minute or so, um, the, the, I just want to basically show you that the gallium-68 generator is something that globally, uh, we're, we're, everyone's jumping on board, um, so this is, a uh, PET isotope that is not produced by the cyclotron, <clears throat> but is readily available <clears throat> via, via commercial generators such as this. And <clears throat> the chemistry is all there. Um, uh, folks are, and you can, you can even buy this uh, materials now, but uh, basically you have a, a chelator group here that actually can grab onto the metal, in this case, gallium 68. You have Dota Talk, Dota Knock, and Dota Tate. These are three stomatostatin analogs uh, that, uh, that basically the, the analogs that, that, that target these receptors, that is, and then has a, has a half-life kind of in between carbon-11 F18 with 68 minutes. And so uh, this is just an example of, of the utility of such a cool, uh, the tracer that's uh, coming out. Uh, typically, the standard of care has been looking at indium-111 uh, octreo scans, and you can tell the time of four hours and 24 hours, even imaging, compared to just doing it for one hour, that, that this, uh, this is a, a quite a dramatic uh, image with respect to imaging, in this case with Dota Tate. Okay, in summary, the, the basic uh, chemistry principles I hope I, I was able to share with you today in the limited time I had. Uh, there's a variety of different tracers that, that, that can be targeted in, in three, you know, the areas that we talk uh, uh, with respect to cardiology, neuropsychiatry, and oncology. Uh, and and the, the ultimate uh, um, future with PETMR is quite exciting. And if we can develop more uh, PET radiopharmaceuticals to expand the utility of this extremely sensitive uh, component of PET and also combining this with the awesome uh, uh, um, power of MR imaging for not only structural but also you know, stochopic uh, look by looking at the MR spectroscopy and, and other, other uh, MR um, uh, uh, advantages and tools, uh, then this will really help us uh, potentially uh, in improve our future patient management and uh, with respect to clinical research. So with that, I thank you for your attention.